As your host this week, Chester Whitley, I had the honor of introducing a special awardee, the Roscoe O'Brady Award for Innovation and Accomplishment. Each year, the symposium recognizes one individual for innovation and accomplishment in the field of lysosomal disease research and therapy. This award is named the Roscoe O'Brady Award for Innovation and Accomplishment. It honors one of our early pioneers, Roscoe Brady himself. He's a beloved mentor to many currently working in the field. Dr. Brady passed away in 2016, and to honor his contributions and his spirit, the World Symposium has renamed the award using Roscoe Brady as its name. The award is presented to recognize substantial contributions to lysosomal disease research and therapy, typically somebody who is very active in the field. It's not an end of the career award. It's among the people that have been accomplished but are still actively involved. The recipient is presented with an engraved award and is recognized by the meeting at the meeting held annually in February. The award winner is also invited to present a 30 minute address as the opening speaker at World Symposium and will be published in Molecular Genetics and Metabolism. So with further ado, no further ado, <laughs> these are our past awardees. The list is also available on our website, but let's go to today's awardee. Dr. Ellen Sadransky is a pediatrician and medical geneticist in the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH. She's also now the current branch chief. Dr. Sadransky received her BA from Brandeis University and her MD at Tulane. She trained in pediatrics at Northwestern University and in clinical genetics at the NIH. Dr. Sadransky has been a tenured NIH investigator and section chief since 2000. Her research interests include both clinical and basic aspects of Gaucher disease and Parkinson disease, the studies of genotype phenotype correlation and genetic modifiers, insights from mouse models and novel treatment strategies. She's played a lead role in establishing the association between glucocerebrosidase and Parkinson's disease. She's authored over 200 publications. She continues to focus on the complexity encountered in these simple disorders, the Mendelian conditions, the role of lysosomal pathways in Parkinson's disease, and the development of small molecule chaperone therapy for Gaucher disease and Parkinson's disease. So on behalf of World Symposium nominees and award committee, Congratulations, Dr. Sadransky. Ellen, thank you for all you've done and you're gonna to continue to do. Would you give us a few words? Okay, thank you to the World Symposium and thank you to the Selection Committee for this honor. People often ask me how I can spend my entire career focused on one single rare disorder. I find there's always something new to explore and that these insights have broad implications and I'm humbled realizing that what we understand is just a fraction of what we still don't know. When I first began in the lysosomal storage disease community some 30 years ago, it felt like it was very much a quote, old boys network based in major discrete hubs. This year, it's been particularly rewarding to see the US Gaucher community united to convey management suggestions pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic. Here at world meetings in recent years, I've been thrilled to see a more diverse audience and hope the future innovation awardees will also be women or scientists from underrepresented groups. One's accomplishments don't occur in a void, but they're fostered and enriched by mentors, associates, and trainees. I wanna honor my father, Herschel Sadransky, who showed me the joys of scientific inquiry. My teacher, Emmanuel Shapira, who inspired my path in pediatric genetics, and my mentor, Edward Ginz, who introduced me to molecular genetics, laboratory work, Gaucher disease, and treatment for the lysosomal storage disorders. Throughout the years, I've benefited from and relied on my research and clinical teams, colleagues, and collaborators, as well as a host of awesome trainees who have all kept me engaged and motivated. I've been fortunate to be part of the intramural research program at the National Institutes of Health, especially the rich research environment at the National Human Genome Research Institute. I also want to acknowledge my husband, Ben, and my four kids who have been alongside me all along on this journey. And lastly, I'd like to thank my many patients who have taught me that medicine is complex and that there are always new angles to consider, even in what's thought of as a, quote, simple 
monogenic disorder. Once again, thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about Gaucher disease, how a rare disease how rare diseases provide a window into common disorders. I have nothing to disclose. And I've chosen as a theme for this talk, a, a saying from Confucius that I like. I live in a very small house, but my windows look out on a very large world. In my very small house, I live in the world of Gaucher disease, of rare lysosomal storage disease. And from this vantage point, I've learned a lot about Parkinson disease, a common complex disorder. Studying this connection is done through an integrated translational approach. And in the next 30 minutes, I hope to show you how a Mendelian disorder can provide a window into a seemingly unrelated complex disease. So today I plan to tell you three Gaucher stories. One is from my past, which is how lessons from an early mouse model of Gaucher disease taught us about neonatal Gaucher disease, and it's very much a bench to bedside story resulting in a new description of a new phenotype. The second story is where I live mostly today, which is um, a story of how one patient led to the most common genetic risk factor for Parkinson's disease. And this is more of a bedside to bench story, potentially leading to new par Parkinson therapeutics. And in the last moments, I'll talk about a new story that we're beginning to engage on. So as this audience well knows, Gaucher disease was first described by Philippe Gaucher back in 1882. And in the past five or six decades, a lot of uh, advances in this disorder occurred at my home site, the NIH. And most of this is due to the work of Rasko Brady, who, uh, in whom this honor is named, uh, who had a long career at the NIH. He, it is the first to recognize the enzymatic defect in Gaucher disease, and also the first to introduce a therapy for Gaucher disease in the form of enzyme replacement. My mentor, Ed Gins, was also formative for me at the NIH. Um, he was the first to clone the, the gene for glucose reversidase and to identify the first mutation, and he built the first animal model and the story of Parkinson's disease and Gaucher disease also began um, at the NIH Clinical Center. What's kept me engaged in this disorder has been the vast clinical heterogeneity that we see in Gaucher disease, which classically is divided into non-neuronopathic and um, acute and chronic neuronopathic types. Though the more I see patients, the more I find instances that don't really fit into any one category well. And I've begun to see it more as a continuum ranging from asymptomatic octogenarians that are incidentally diagnosed to fetuses that succumb in utero, <laughs> with the main distinction being some have neurologic manifestations and others don't. But how do we explain this um, heterogeneity in a presumably single gene disorder? Well, when I first came, I mentioned that Dr. Gins had a clone of glucose reversidase gene which is located on 1Q21. Almost immediately, he was aware that there was a highly homologous pseudogene that was only 16 kb downstream. And this is important because the sequence shares 96% homology and many, or at least some of the mutant alleles originate from this pseudogene uh, sequence in the form of rec recombinant alleles. Today, somewhere between 400 and 800 pathologic variants have been described. Uh, there's more each day. They include point mutations, frame shifts, deletions, and, and insertions. Some are common, like the ones we call N370S and L44P. Most of them are fairly rare, but they're located throughout the different exons of the gene. And there are also some common variants that are recognized that don't cause Gaucher disease. I've become to appreciate, though, that the number of different genotypes is been expanding in parallel with the number of clinical phenotypes that we see. So while we've spent considerable effort trying to do genotype-phenotype studies, we've appreciated some correlations, like the N370S mutation is exclusively associated with type 1 Gaucher disease, but clinically different patients can have the same genotype. Clinically similar patients can have many different genotypes, 
and siblings with the identical genotype can exhibit different clinical manifestations and responses to therapy, even identical twins. Some examples, a uh, number of years ago, we published a cohort of 32 L44P homozygotes. And while just about everybody shared slow horizontal saccades, the systemic and neurologic manifestations were extremely variable. And the outcomes ranged from death in childhood to autism to successful college students, even a Jeopardy champion. Likewise, with M370S, we see a great deal of heterogeneity. This is from a paper by Greg Grabowski, where he um, represented the age of a uh, diagnosis of uh, about 2,500 patients. And especially those that are homozygous for M370S can present really at any age. So my first story is at the far end of the spectrum, the uh, neonatal Gaucher disease, which became recognized mainly because of the nololeal Gaucher mouse. This was the first animal model of a lysosomal storage disease that created in Ed Ginz's lab in 1992. These mice, uh, and you can see the affected mouse here, um, have no glucosuribrutitis activity, elevated lipid levels. They're cyanotic, and you can appreciate their dry, skew, peely skin, and they die within six hours of birth. Well, this actually was a surprise to us because we had never considered Gaucher disease a disorder of skin nor a newborn disorder. But we started to appreciate that, in fact, there were babies with type 2 who presented prenatally at birth. And we had to dig through a lot of old literature. But usually, the cases were only recognized post-mortem. Today, the phenotype is being recognized much more frequently. And it includes both colloidian babies, these are babies that have a, mem a membrane on their skin, and hydrops fetalis. And many of these babies indeed have null alleles. So Gaucher disease is now considered in the differential diagnosis of congenital ichthyosis and hydrops fetalis in the nursery. Well, why the skin involvement? It turns out that glucosal ceramide and ceramide are both important components of the intracellular bilayers in the stratum cornea and normal skin. And when you measure the glucosal ceramide and ceramide, the ratios are flipped in, in both the babies and mice with type 2 Gaucher disease. Also, when you measure transepidermal water loss, it's much greater in the homozygous Gaucher mice, indicating that the barrier function is disrupted. When we look at the ultrastructure of skin, both the mouse and human skin have these ribbon-like straight um, bilayer structures, whereas both the type 2 mouse and type 2 babies have this disruptive appearance of their bilayers. In fact, we have <clears throat> done these studies on about 20 patients with type 2 Gaucher disease, three with type 3 and, and two with type 1, and only the patients with type 2 show these glomerular cliffs and immature membranes, which may indicate that they could potentially be used for diagnosis. So here, our bench findings led to new clinical insights. Our studies of, Gauch of type 2 Gaucher disease have continued, and we recently summarized the natural history in now the 21st century. Traditionally, a Gaucher disease, in the, type 2 Gaucher disease in the textbooks is a disorder of infancy. Usually, it, it was stated that the prognosis was less than a year. In these 22 patients, we found that they presented by age one to four months. Um, usually, they were diagnosed by age two to eight months, but those that received no aggressive therapy universally died by about 10 months. Treated babies with enzyme replacement, uh, ambroxol, or bone marrow transplants are living longer, but they required extensive support, including feeding tubes and tracheostomy, and the neurologic outcome remains dismal. But I think these kinds of studies are really important, especially now that there are some upcoming therapeutic trials for type 2 Gaucher disease. The other thing that we've been investigating is whether there, is, there are facial features which can help us to distinguish patients with type 2 Gaucher disease. And I direct you to the poster of Emily Dakin. Uh, we are collecting photos. And if people would like to, to um, collaborate, we'd be happy to include patient photos with consents. So today, the Gaucher phenotype is far broader than what I learned when I came on board 30 years ago. It encompasses all of these um, newer phenotypes. Uh, some that I'm going to highlight briefly are uh, EEG abnormalities. We recently 
studied 281 EEGs on 64 patients with type 3 Gaucher disease over the past 50 years. And about 91% had at least one study with background slowing, uh, and about half had epileptiform activity. We also have been studying cognition and looked at uh, full scale um, verbal and performance IQs of patients that were evaluated, 34 patients with type 3 who were evaluated 1 to 18 times over the last 30 years. Consistently, Full IQs are really variable, ranging from about 39 to 125. Um, but the verbal IQs were consistently higher than the performance IQs, which is important for educational planning. And over time, the values varied, but there was no clear trajectory. So we really can't consider this a neurodegenerative disorder. So I think it's important to appreciate that now, as treated patients are living longer, new phenotypes are being revealed. And this is, again, critical baseline data for future trials. So this is the story that continues to unfold. So now I'm going to move to my second story, which is related to Parkinsonian manifestations. Parkinson disease is a clinically and pathologically defined entity with some of the features shown in this cartoon. By definition, it includes bradykinesia and at least one of the following muscular rigidity, a rest, tremor, and postural instability. Parkinsonism is the term describing the motor features of Parkinson's disease, and dementia with Lewy bodies is a disorder with more severe cognitive deficits and more rapid progression. <laughs> These disorders are also known as the synucleinopathies because this protein alpha-synuclein um, is aggregate prone, and it's found in these Lewy bodies in the brains of these patients. Here you can see one, an interneuronal um, Lewy body. So this second story for me began in my clinic back in 1996 with a single patient with Gaucher disease who developed Parkinsonism. I'll show her here, it's kind of a granular um, video, but she had very mild Gaucher disease diagnosed at age 19, but her tremor developed at age 42. She developed Excellent. progressive rigidity, Excellent. which you can see here, okay. masked face, difficulty initiating movements, and a deterioration of her gait. She had no improvement with enzyme replacement, developed progressive dementia, and died at age 54. So was this a coincidence? Just because you have a, a rare disorder doesn't make you immune from other common disorders. But actually, when we talked to colleagues and looked through the literature, um, we discovered that there were other cases, especially a series from um, the Jerusalem group. And in 2003, we published a collection of 17 similar patients that we were able to genotype and review the phenotype. Now, the story might have ended there, except for what I consider a serendipitous discovery. Uh, I was contacted by a former um, Howard Hughes student of Dr. Ginn's that I had met early on um, in his laboratory. And she called me because she was performing, she was now a neuropathologist fellow at Mass General, and she was performing an autopsy on a, an individual with Parkinson disease. And she read in the chart that the patient had Gaucher disease, Googled it, and saw our publication. She offered to provide me with samples from the autopsy. And of course, I was thrilled. But I asked her if she could also provide some control Parkinson brains that were age matched. Well, the package arrived in our laboratory. And those of you who have used the frozen tissues, they come on dry ice and the labels are really hard to read. So we weren't really sure which one was the Parkinson sample. So we, which one was the Gaucher sample? So we extracted um, the enzyme and we extracted the protein and did enzymatic assays and discovered that one of the samples indeed had very deficient glucose reversitase, but the other two were also much lower than we anticipated. So we went back and took out DNA and when, lo and behold, one was an N370S homozygote, but the other two both carried pathologic variants in glucose reversitase. So this really blew us away. We contacted Kathy again and then multiple different brain banks and quickly collected 57 different brain bank samples of patients with Parkinson disease and found that 12 of them had variants in glucose reversitis. Uh, 
We then went back and also collected control brains from the same uh, brain banks and didn't find mutations there. But I have to tell you that that was one of the papers that I had that have been the hardest to publish. Um, it had multiple rejections, but ultimately was out in 2004. Simultaneously, we were getting other information when we started taking really careful family histories of our Gaucher probands, and dis we discovered that there was Parkinson disease in heterozygotes. Often, this was a parent or grandparent who was an obligate glucose or lupus, uh, 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 obligate Gaucher carrier. So the associations persisted, was replicated in Parkinson centers worldwide, where each showed an increased frequency of GBA variants compared to matched control. What helped promote this, so the acceptance of the finding is this international multi-center study that we published in 2009 that included 16 centers on four continents where we genotyped over 10,000 individuals, half with Parkinson's disease and half controls. And we determined even screening for two common mutations that subjects with Parkinson's disease were greater than five times more likely to have a GBA mutation. We later performed a second multi-center um, study with individuals with dementia with Lewy bodies. This is more rare. We had 721 cases and the odds ratio was even higher, 8.21. And so today we'd say in Parkinson disease, three to 12% of patients carry a GBA variant and among Gashkenazi Jews, it's probably as high as 15 to 33%. <laughs> we also already started to note that the Gaucher mutation carriers tended to have an earlier age at Parkinson onset. The number of publications on this has really risen exponentially from, from the time of our first um, paper. And in fact, now if you um, Google glucocerebrositis or GBA or do a PubMed, you see far more publications on Parkinson's disease than you do on Gaucher disease. And at the same time, it's also directed attention to the role of the lysosome and neurodegeneration. And again, this is a field that's really been taking off. So in our group, we have been doing longitudinal clinical studies on our patients to see if we can find early clinical and imaging features that might be predictive of Parkinsonism in patients with GBA mutations. Uh, running this study is Dr. Grisel Lopez, and she recruits patients with Gaucher disease and um, Gaucher carriers with Parkinson disease. And at the same time, we recruit patients with Gaucher disease and carriers who don't have Parkinson disease, but have a strong positive family history and a parent or sibling. Patients come and go through a uniform evaluation, including physical neurologic exams, neurocognitive evaluations, olfactory testing, and, and multiple different screens and questionnaires for non-motor symptoms. And at the same time, we do some imaging studies for a while. We had a long protocol on doing flora dopa PET, and we've also been piloting transcranial sonography. So from this 13-year longitudinal single neurologist uh, study, we've had more than 500 patient visits. We find that our pa patients with Parkinson's disease have clinical and pathologic findings that resemble idiopathic Parkinson disease, though some have a dementia with Lewy body-like phenotype. Their response to lipidopa is similar to idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but they tend to have an earlier age of Parkinson onset. Positive family history is more likely. Non-motor symptoms are, are common. Uh, there's a faster progression, and it appears that the mutation might matter there's some indication that severe alleles might be associated with more cognitive dysfunction. But in our cohort, we've seen exceptions and we do see variation in cognitive finding. We published 20 patients sharing both Gaucher disease and Parkinsonism a few years ago. And here we found that we had um, different Parkinson phenotypes. We had multiple genotypes. Most of the patients were responsive to levodopa, but of course didn't have any improvement with enzyme replacement or substrate reduction. And olfactory and cognitive impairment was common. And the mean age of PD diagnosis was relatively early at, at age 49. But we saw variations. For example, the woman on the left um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in her 40s. Um, she had a 28-year course and only had late cognitive changes before her death at 68. 
the gentleman in, in the middle um, had an onset in his very late 50s. When we first saw him, he already had early cognitive changes and he died by age 62. And the gentleman on the right was a professor from Israel sent by Ari Zimron. He um, had his onset of Parkinsonism in his 60s, um, knew seven languages, used to chat with our texts in Chinese. And he died at age 78 from unrelated causes with normal cognition. So we really cautioned using GBA status to predict the Parkinsonian course. I mentioned PET studies this was a long collaboration with Karen Ber Berman at the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, we studied fluoridopa measuring regional brain dopamine uh, synthesis. And in our first study, we recruited 59 patients with um, GBA mutations, both carriers and patients with Gaucher disease, of which 17 had Parkinson's disease. And when we compared um, the KI, which reflects presynaptic dopamine synthesis capacity, we found that our patients with Gaucher and Parkinson resembled those with idiopathic Parkinson disease. But we didn't see any dopamine loss in any of our at-risk patients. So we realized that we were going to have to keep this up much longer. And so we uh, initiated a longitudinal study, which went on for nine years. Patients came in two to five times over a, a period of about two to nine years. And for this longer study, we had 33 patients with GBA mutations, eight of which had, um, had uh, Parkinson's disease. But you can see that we really, when we looked even longitudinally, we saw no difference in the rate of dopamine loss between our at-risk subjects and the controls. Well, one of the issues is, non, is low penetrance. Uh, in the course of the study, only one of the 42 at-risk participants that we followed developed Parkinson's disease, and he actually had a normal PET study one year prior. So we're no longer doing PET scans, uh, but we're focusing on other things one of which is sim pairs with Gaucher disease. And we've collected about 10 pairs where only one has Parkinson's disease. And we've evaluated these guys from between one and 12 years. Each time we do the same battery of evaluations. Thus far, we haven't seen any indications of Parkinsonism or changes in PET in the non-Parkinson sib. And each time they come, we collect different biosamples because I think that these kind of uh, studies will be very useful as we try to identify risk or protective alleles for Parkinson's disease. Because you have to remember that most patients and most carriers don't develop Parkinsonism. It's a risk factor, but it does give us a challenge and that's to identify the other factors or genes that might increase or decrease one's risk for Parkinson's disease, both through these clinical evaluations, but also through some genomic approaches. And today we have multiple new technologies that are enabling us to unravel the different factors contributing to our complex individual tapestries. So our strategies are now to combine different genomic um, methodologies, including um, studying genomes, epigenomes, and transcriptomes. There's different approaches. You can look at patients with Parkinson's disease with and without mutations. And in fact, that's being done by some of the large Parkinson consortiums that have big numbers of GBA mutation carriers. But for a more Gaucher-centric point of view, I think it's really important to evaluate Gaucher patients with and without Parkinson's disease. And we now have a consortium put together to use dense genotype arrays, and we'd be glad to include anybody who'd be interested in contributing samples. We will also do some whole genome sequencing studies. And we are also attempting to collect brain samples for RNA-seq studies of potential somatic mosaicism and epigenetic evaluations. But collaboration is essential for these kinds of uh, studies in a rare disorder, because otherwise we'll never have enough statistical power. So though I've been thinking about it for over a decade now, I think the link between alpha synuclein and glucocerebrosidase still isn't clear. What we do know is there is an inverse relationship between the two proteins. And we also know that patients with Parkinson's disease without GBA mutations tend to have less glucocerebrosidase. However, it doesn't, it does, you have to remember that not all people with deficient glucocerebrosidase get Parkinsonism. 
And I think that probably different factors that are related to aging play a role. As we get older, we have more alpha-synuclein, lysosomal function is um, less optimal, and we have lower levels of glucose erythrocytase. So perhaps aging contributes to shifting the balance. So the important question is whether this link could lead to improved therapeutics. As we all know, there are some really important Gaucher drugs that have um, revolutionized treatment for patients, but they're very expensive, inconvenient, and they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So there have been other strategies that many of you are involved with, trying to get substrate reduction across the brain, doing gene therapy to the brain, strategies to get enzyme into the brain. The one that's closest to my heart is um, looking for glucose erythrocytase chaperones. And this is a disease modifying therapy to promote glucose erythrocytase folding to recover lysosomal function. <clears throat> so the question is whether chaperoning might be useful to treat both Gaucher disease and potentially GBA associated or idiopathic Parkinson disease. Ordinarily, uh, when glucose erythrocytase is synthesized, it's stabilized by molecular chaperones. It gets, to its, it gets folded and it becomes active when it's in its tertiary form within the lysosome. If you have a mutation, you have a problem with your folding and it tends to get degraded and you, the enzyme doesn't get to the lysosome. So the hope with chemical chaperones is to identify compounds that can help stabilize and fold the mutant protein where it can eventually be uh, active when it gets into the lysosome. And in these, this endeavor, I've been collaborating with a great team at NCATS at NIH that does high throughput screening. Um, we had a, a novel me method of screening. We actually used um, an extract from a frozen Gaucher spleen. Uh, we did a high throughput screen on about a quarter of a million compounds. And for the first time, we identified non-inhibitory chaperones. So we have two um, lead compound groups that we tried with iPSC-derived macrophages, and we found that when we treat our Gaucher macrophages, shown here, filled with lipid storage from um, erythrocytes, we can clear out a lot of the lipid, and we can also restore macrophage function. We then moved to iPSC-derived neuronal models, um, looking at um, different lines from patients with Gaucher, different forms of Gaucher disease. And we find that our Gaucher IPS dopaminergic neurons correctly have decreased glucose erythrocytase activity as they store glucosal ceramide and glucose sphingosine. <coughs> we also found that when you um, look at these um, neurons uh, microscope, you find that in, in the controls, we see co nice co-localization between glucose erythrocytase and lysosomal marker lymph 2 But in, in patients, we see very little glucose erythrocytase getting to the, the lysosome. So in many ways, these neurons recapitulate the Gaucher phenotype. And when we treat with the lead chaperone, we're able to see improved chap chaperoning reflected in this nice co-localization with the lysosomal marker. We've also measured glucose erythrocytase activity in treated cell lines, and you can see that it's increased nicely by these purple arrows. We've measured um, glucosal, glucosal ceramide and glucosal sphingosine, and we see reversal of storage um, when we treat the cells with the lead chaperone. <clears throat> and perhaps most exciting at all, of all, we've noted that alpha-synuclein levels in our iPSC-derived dopaminergic neurons from patients with Gaucher disease and Parkinson's disease are elevated, but when we treat with our lead chaperone, we see a reduction. And this suggests that our lead chaperone um, could potentially have efficacy in Parkinson's disease. <coughs> So lastly, I just want to introduce a new story um, that was motivated from another patient, a young child referred to us from um, Nazareth. Uh, she was, uh, had normal birth and development, but at age nine months, um, she was hospitalized for an infection at splenomegaly and low platelets, and a very astute clinician suspected a lysosomal storage disorder. And indeed, she had very low glucose erythrocytase. A young patient like this always um, 
presents a dilemma because it's really hard to predict what the phenotypic um, outcome will be. Well, here we had a clue. This baby had um, genotype D409H, D409H. And this is a, a genotype that's seen in a, exclusively in a rare subset of type three patients. It's a, seen in countries around the world, though first in the Middle East. There is no shared haplotype. And this form is universally fatal in adolescents because of these calcifications of the cardiac valves. You can see it nicely on the, this, this radiographic study. Even when you transplant the valves, uh, they, re they recalcify, and it doesn't seem to be preventable with enzyme replacement. So when we saw this child at age three, she had been treated with um, enzyme replacement and Bruxel. She had normal growth and development, no organomegaly. She did have ocular motor apraxia, and she had a normal echo and cardiac MRI. So the challenge is how can we prevent this ominous uh, prognosis in young children like this? And um, we are now focusing attention on trying to better understand the disease pathogenesis we have her fibroblasts differentiated into iPSCs, which are, will be a, a differentiated further into valvular and inter interstitial cells. We're working on models in zebra fish and mice, and ultimately we hope to do screening to identify drug targets. And it's also really intriguing to think about what this might teach us about cardiac valvular pathology in general. So my suggestion for all of you in the audience is keep looking out those windows, you never know what kind of direction your patients will lead you in. So studies of a Mendelian disorder can in many ways provide a nice window into complex disease. So I wanna acknowledge um, the people in my section who do the work day in, day out, um, the students uh, that, uh, that enrich our studies every day, my collaborators around the world and at NIH, the group at NCATS, the NIH Technology Transfer Office and core facilities. And I wanna give special thanks to our patients, their family members and caregivers and their referring physicians that make this work possible. Thank you.